This is Candy with eyes to jesus.blogspot.com and today I thought I would do a quick review on one of my top favorite study Bibles and that would be the Life Application Study Bible and I'm specifically talking about their third edition which is the most current newest one that they have. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily jump up, jump up and down for joy for the first edition. Uh, I had it and it really was just life application. It was a life application Bible. I'm unsure of the second edition, but the third edition, it's not the life application Bible, it's the life application study Bible. And I have two of them. I have this one, I think this is the more standard size. It's not the more personal size, but it's not the large print size. And isn't this pretty? And it's got this beautiful gold uh, decor and lettering on the spine. I like the floral and the teal and the blue. And uh, this Life Application Study Bible, of course, is third edition, and uh, this one is in the New Living Translation. Um, this one is put out by Tyndale Publishing. Uh, Zondervan is also putting out third edition Life Application Study Bibles. Uh, the Tyndale Publishing ones uh, tend to only have one ribbon marker, so I added a second. Uh, this one came with kind of this peachy one, and then I added this blue one because I like two ribbon markers. Now, if you get any of the third edition Life Application Study Bibles put out by Zondervan, the Zondervan ones already come with two ribbon markers. I just happen to think that uh, the Life Application Study Bibles put out by Tyndale are cuter, are prettier. So I have this one in the New Living Translation, but the main one that I use when I'm in the Life Application Study Bible, again, third edition, is this one. And this one is also put out by Tyndale Publishers, and this one is in the 2011 version of the New International Version. Now, some people have wondered, why do I so often say the year 2011 when I'm referring to the NIV? And that's because the 1984 NIV was the one I was used to, and it's not a very it's not a very great translation. There's a lot of problems with the 1984 NIV. I don't like the 1984 NIV, uh, but the 2011 NIV has some massive great improvements. The 2011 NIV is actually quite surprisingly quite a bit more literal in its translation than the 1984 NIV. So when I talk about the New International Version, I am not a fan of the 1984 New International Version. I am a fan of the 2011 NIV. It needs more improvements, but it's vastly, vastly more, vastly improved over the 1984 NIV. So uh, this is in the NIV, and it only comes, uh, when it's in the NIV, it's only coming out in the 2011 NIV for the third edition, so that's fabulous. And uh, this one is in their personal size. Now the Tyndale personal size life application study Bible is smaller than the Zondervan personal size life application study Bible. The Zondervan one is taller, and I believe also it's a little bit more wider, but uh, the Tyndale personal size is just... I think it's probably my favorite footprint for a Bible. It's kind of this, it's small and it's chunky, but it's not too tiny. Now, one complaint I have about the Life Application Study Bible, and I've seen this both in the Zondervan and the Tyndale printings, is, I, I, in my opinion, the pages are too thin. There is a lot of bleed through. Now, I can still read them just fine. Unlike the um, SBL Study Bible, if you'd like to see my review of that, that's in my Bible Reviews playlist on my YouTube channel that I to Jesus. The SBL NRSV UE Study Bible, that one has so much bleed through that I can barely read that Bible because it bleeds through so much. So at least the Life Application Study Bible it has a lot of bleed through, but it's still quite readable. I would not suggest marking in these, and if you do, just be careful, and I would not suggest journaling or any extensive writing in these, because everything's just going to show right on through or even bleed through the page. Uh, but 
Uh, when it comes to a study Bible, I would say this is the most versatile one that you can recommend to just about everybody, whether they be academic or devotional. You have, the, you have it all in the Life Application Study Bible. Not so in the Life Application Bible, the first edition. That was mostly just devotional. But this one is both devotional and academic, and I really appreciate that. Um, and it does have plenty of uh, charts uh, and little mini articles, like you can see here, uh, there's a chart mini article. And the NIV Life Application Study but like this one, the accent color here is a pink. Uh, in the NLT Life Application Study Bible, uh, the accent color I actually like better is, here's one right there, is green. And I like the green accent better, but I like the 2011 NIV better than the New Living Translation. However, if you're going to do a New Living Translation, I recommend you do the 2013 New Living Translation, and that's what this is. The uh, previous edition of the New Living Translation was much, much worse than the 2013 NLT. So, I like the NLT, but I really like the 2011 NIV so much better. So this one is in the color that they call Berry Tyndale. Again, it only came with one ribbon marker. It came with the red one. I added a second one. I added the black one so that I can have two ribbon markers in here. And uh, I just marked a few things here uh, to show you. So let me uh, grab my reading glasses and I'll just show a few things in here for you. So I'm not going to go extensively through like all the front matter and stuff, but it has your general presentation page. But surprisingly after that, they have family tree pages if you like to fill that out. So you can also make this into a family Bible. So you have a family tree page and then you have a special memories page. And uh, yeah, and then you have your general normal uh, first pages and title pages and copyright pages and then I'm just going to go through some I'm just going to highlight some of the things here on the table of contents for the front and back matter uh, so yeah in the front matter you have of course the uh, different uh, table of contents alphabetical list of the bio, of the books in the Bible and then uh, and then the list of the books in the Bible in the Old Testament and the New Testament um, it explains the NIV cross reference system and abbreviations in this one it gives you a preface tells you the contributors um, it tells you why the life application study Bible is unique it'll give a chronology of Bible events and world events and it, go, it has an article called what is application and then it goes into the features of the life application study Bible then you go into the Old Testament now does the life application study Bible have material between the testaments it does have a few things uh, it has a harmony of the books of Kings and Chronicles that's handy and it also has the time between the Old and New Testament so that's probably where it's going to get into the Maccabean Revolt, where uh, Hanukkah originated, etc. Uh, and then you go into the New Testament, and then there's a whole bunch of back matter after the New Testament. I'm not going to read it all to you from the table of contents. Let's highlight some of the major ones. Uh, but yeah, you have events of Christ and the harmony of the Gospels. They compare the four Gospels, uh, parables of Jesus, Jesus' miracles. Um, it, this is handy where it's got the Messianic prophecies and their fulfillments. And then, of course, it's got maps, like maps of Paul's journeys. Uh, it's got some resources for Christian workers. It's got a Bible reading plan, if you like following those. Um, and then there's uh, abbreviations and indexes and your standard stuff that's in the back of most Bibles. Now... The uh, layout is generally uh, single column text and it's got references and the references are on the inner side and that's great. That means your Bible text is never going to fall into the gutter. And by the way, these lay flat nice, even the small one does. Uh, so it's single column text. Your references are on the inside, which is handy. And then uh, you have two column notes here on the bottom. And then as I previously showed you, um, in the NIV one, uh, your charts and little side articles are going to be shaded pink. In the NLT one, they will be shaded green. And I don't know what shade it is in any of the other translations, such as the KJV, because I don't have any of those. And then just taking a look at some of the notes, because what's the most important part of a Bible study? It's notes. 
Well, you will have embedded maps and some geographical information. I love that because it's nice to kind of look at a map next to where you're reading instead of flipping to the back of your Bible and hoping that there is an applicable map there. And I don't know about you, but I know I'm more likely to actually look at the map and pay attention if it's right there on the same page or the page next to it than I am to flip to the back and see if they have a map. All right, so yeah, so right here, this is in Genesis uh, chapter 1. It has that map and some information about the geographical area, and then it has a little article called the Bible on an under section called Beginnings. And uh, I just wanted to take a look at um, what are their notes on Genesis chapter 1, verse 2. Okay, so Genesis chapter 1, verse 2 says, Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Is a life application study Bible gap theory, like the Dake is, for example. Uh, now there's multiple notes on it, but one of the notes on this verse says, The statement, the earth was formless and empty, provides the setting for the creation narrative that follows. I agree. During the second and third days of creation, God gave form to the universe. During the next three days, God filled the earth with living things. The darkness was dispelled on the first day when God created light. So this is not a gap theory Bible. I'm good with that. I, I don't adhere to the gap theory. I'm not saying that it isn't true, but I am saying I haven't seen anything that so far when I've studied the Bible has lent to me thinking it is true. I'm open to the possibility, but I don't think that is the situation. Uh, and then uh, it doesn't really have anything on uh, Genesis uh, 3.15 um, or in that area a whole lot regarding the woman and the fall. Um, it doesn't really have anything about uh, in Genesis chapter 2, I think verse 18. It doesn't really bring out how uh, the woman is an azer kinegdo, which means the woman isn't, uh, isn't just some helper servant that was created to serve man, but that in Hebrew we see that uh, she is the counterpart, the missing piece that the man needed, and that she is to help him not necessarily in a servile way. The word azer um, is most of the time in the Old Testament referred to God rescuing his people. And uh, that's the type of helper that the, that the wife Eve was. Uh, there's no notes on that. So, I mean, that's not a plus or a minus. It would be great if that was in there. But that is in there in every woman's Bible, uh, if that's something that you would like to uh, look at. And I have an extensive review on every woman's Bible in my Bible Reviews playlist. Uh, and then, yeah, I mean, the Old Testament notes, they're fairly good. I, really, I don't have much problem with that. Um, Psalm 6811, there's no notes on that. That's sad, but that's not the end of the world, and that's fine. Uh, going into the New Testament, um, there's not... Well, okay, like, uh, okay, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Uh, there's actually multiple notes on uh, chapter 11, verse 3. Now, if you read the notes, this is what's interesting in the third edition Life Application Study Bible. You can tell they're written by different people with different doctrinal views because sometimes there'll be two or more, more notes on the same verse. And in some places it's like, wait... They just said this here, but now they're saying this here. Those are two opposing views, so it can appear contradictory. So just recall, the notes are written by different people, and the different people had different views. But furthermore, um, some of the notes in here, we'll see them complementary. Some in here will see light egalitarian, which is fabulous. And then sometimes you'll have a note that's complementarian, but then the next note on it would be egalitarian or vice versa. And so, yeah, recall, don't think of it as the notes are contradicting themselves, but keep in mind there's multiple contributors here. So I want to take a look at one of the notes for uh, 1 Corinthians 11.3, where it says, uh, and if we read that verse, 1 Corinthians 11.3, uh, it says, it's kind of going across two pages here, but I want you to realize that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. And then one of the notes here says, The statement, the head of every man, and every man is Christ, reminds us of Christ's authority over every man and ultimately over every person. It could also be a reminder, and this is where it's more accurate, that Christ is the source of every man, 
either because Christ was present at the creation or the first man, or because Christ is every believer's source of life in the new creation. The statement, the head of the woman is man, does not indicate the man's control or supremacy, but rather his being her source, because man was created first. The woman derives her existence from man, as man does from Christ, and Christ from God. Uh, so it starts out kind of given the fallacy that head here means authority, which it doesn't mean, but then it goes in and it gets correct, and it talks about how head means source. Now, I don't have a second edition life application study Bible, and I no longer have the first edition life application Bible, but I am wondering if this note was originally complementarian and it was edited to be more egalitarian, but they left the beginning part still complementarian. Uh, I don't know. I think the wording of it can be um, obscure or confusing. But uh, head here, uh, which is the Greek kephale, uh, head in English symbolically means authority, but head in the Koine Greek didn't symbolically mean authority, it symbolically meant source. Unless you think just because Adam was created before Eve, Adam has preeminence or authority over Eve. Uh, this chapter in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 goes over that's not the case. If you take a look at verses 11 and 12, it talks about, okay, but where do you think every single man came from since then? Every single man since then came from woman. So source is not authority. It's just an origination. Uh, and then, let's see here, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, okay, so verses 34 and 35 where it says, women should remain silent in the churches, they are not allowed to speak, but must be in submission as the law says. If they want to inquire about something, they should ask their own husbands at home, for it is disgraceful for women to speak in the church. Or did the word of God originate with you, etc.? Okay, now it's got some, it's got a lot of notes on this. So just reading part of a note, it says, Does this mean that women should not speak in church services today? It is clear from chapter 11, verse 5, that women prayed and prophesied in public worship. It is also clear from 1 Corinthians 12 through 14 that women are given spiritual gifts and are encouraged to exercise them in the body of Christ. Therefore, we know that women have much to, con to contribute and should be encouraged to participate in worship services. Fabulous note. I couldn't agree more. However, they could have taken it even further, such as they did in every women's Bible, where uh, these two verses were likely Paul quoting the Corinthians from the previous letter that they wrote to him, where the Corinthians were quoting Cato, the elder, as recorded by Livy. That they were quoting, well, this is a teaching through Cato that we got through Livy's records, so... We think, we're thinking this is how it's supposed to happen in the church, that the women are supposed to be silent in the church. And then Paul responds to that in verse 36, where the NIV starts with the word or, but the revised uh, standard version of the Bible has it more correct, where it starts with what. So Paul responds to them saying women are supposed to be silent in churches, and Paul responds to that and said, what, did the word of God originate with you, or are you the only people that, I have a sticky tab in the way. Or are you the only people that it has reached? If anyone thinks that they are a prophet or otherwise gifted by the Spirit, let them acknowledge that what I'm writing to you is the Lord's command. But if anyone ignores this, they will themselves be ignored. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, be eager to prophesy and do not forbid speaking in tongues. Uh, so it's more likely that this was Paul responding to a quote from the Corinthians and that this is actually Paul standing up for women speaking in the church. So it doesn't really get into that view, which I believe is the correct view. However, the note it did give here, I thought was pretty well done. Uh, Galatians, uh, let's take a look at Galatians 3.28, right? The Magna Carta of the New Testament. Uh, so Galatians 3.28, that's where it says, There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for ye are you are all one in Christ Jesus. And then it's got a lot of notation on that, so I'll read you some of the notes where it says, Some Jewish men greeted each new day by praying, Lord, thank you that I am not a Gentile, a slave, 
or a woman. Under the Holy Spirit's inspiration, Paul showed clearly how Christianity enhanced the role of women immeasurably. Faith in Christ transcends all differences and makes all believers one in Him. Make sure you do not impose distinctions that Christ has removed because all believers are His heirs and we all have equal privileges and standing with Him. And I think that's fabulous too. Make sure you do not impose distinctions that Christ has removed. Uh, so I thought that was that was a really good note and worthy of having there. And then you have uh, this really handy chat. This really handy chart takes up uh, almost the whole page called the distortions of Christianity. And again, the NIV version such as this one is it's going to be shaded pink. In the New Living Translation, it's going to be shaded green. Um, yeah, so I would say the notes in here, just giving you a sampling there, I think the notes are pretty good. Like I said, some of them will appear contradictory. It's almost like they took some of the previous notes or they moved half of them, half of them, but then kept maybe the first half or the second half, and then they updated the notes. Uh, where maybe here and there there should have been some sentences that should have been fully removed because it makes the notes seem contradictory. Uh, there's also places where, remember, you have multiple contributors, so you can have some opposite and opposing views. So just keeping that in mind, if you keep that in mind, I think the Life Application Study Bible is a fabulous Bible to have in your collection. And if you are not heavily academic, but you would like some of the academic stuff, but you really appreciate the devotional as well, then your sweet spot probably is going to be the Life Application Study Bible 3rd Edition. Have a blessed day.